This is an interview with Mr. Jimmy Lewis Warren of the Birmingham Civil Rights Institute's Oral History Project. I'm Dr. Horace Hunter. We are at the Birmingham Civil Rights Institute. Today is May 17, 1996. And I want to thank you, Mr. Warren, for taking time out of your busy schedule to come and talk with me today. Thank you. I just want to start by just asking some general questions about your family and your, your, your background. Where were you born? I was born in Maryland, Alabama. It's a kind of called Paris County. Paris County. 1942. Okay. That's that's down in uh, in the Black Belt area, right? right? Okay. That's a, about 20 miles from Salem, Alabama. Okay. Were your mother and father from that area as well? Yes. They were both born in that area? Right. Uh-huh. Uh, how many brothers and sisters did you have? I have uh, six sisters. And six brothers. Oh yeah, big family. Where do you fit in in there? Were you the youngest and oldest? I'm the seventh child. Seventh child. Yeah. So you right there in the middle there. Right. Yeah. Um, did your mother and father tell me just a bit about your mother and father? How much education did they have? Uh, they didn't have very much. Uh, I don't know how, how much. Many, you don't know how many years they I don't went know how to many school. years they went to school because my mother died in 48. Mm -hmm. And I was six years old when she died. Right. And did your, did your mother work outside of the home? No, she was a, uh, a person there who stayed at home and tended to the family. Oh, okay. So she, she had plenty of work to do right. that. I 12 children. Yeah. Uh, what kind of work did your father do? My father was a farm. Okay. Did you own your own farm? Did mm -hmm. he own the farm? No, we, we didn't. He was something like a sharecropper. Oh, okay. And uh, so all the children worked in the on the farm with him as well? Yes. Uh, we all worked on the farm and we were somewhat... Uh, uh, my dad was the, the leader of the farm, but he didn't own the farm. We weren't a group of people that weren't a type of slave like it just, uh, we were living on the play that belonged to a white man, uh -huh. and they called it sharecropping. Yeah. As a young child, how do you, what do you remember about um, living on the farm and working? Well, I remember. As a matter of fact, that subject is hard to erase because uh, I can think more back then and what how I came up and I can't at this present time because uh, being on the farm is it, it was nice really because I grew up when I was a kid and I, I learned how to live and uh, and to provide for myself on the farm and we had to grow everything that most would be. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I was some like a, a shepherd that who had to tend to the cows and hogs and what have you. Mm -hmm. okay. So you had hogs and cows, uh, you have chickens? Yes, mm -hmm. we did. You know, we had everything that come to livestock um, mm -hmm. for to survive on. That's one thing that the ship crowd did on. We own our own uh, beef and and what have, but no. Oh, so that was yours? Yeah. Was, okay. You, you share crop, but what, what kind of uh, crops did you plant? The share crop was, uh, it was something like half and half. Mm -hmm. uh, my dad was funding the labor, and, the, and the, uh, uh, the white man, which was the owner of the property, uh, he funded the land. And so, uh, since my father finished the finished the uh, the labor, so the uh, the owner of the property would get half, and my father would get half. Okay. Um, did you were you farming cotton? Cotton, corn, and that's the only thing he got half of. Uh, the owner of the property, cotton and corn. Mm -hmm. Did you plant other? Crops as well? Uh, yeah, such as uh, peas and, and, and greens and you name it, okra, any type of vegetable that you 
watermelons, peanuts, potatoes, white potatoes, on and on. All of that knows for for the family. That's right. That's all. For the right. Uh, the chef cropper only only got half of the corn, half of the cotton. Right. right. Tell me about your schooling. What What do you remember about your your elementary school? For instance? My elementary school that uh, I went to elementary school, what they call uh, Providence, and could not go there but blast in that time. And we had to walk to school, and, uh, and all the people that lived around the white or white was in the same community, but white went to separate schools, and uh, they also had bus to ride. We walked to school. Mm. How far did you have to walk? In one case, uh, when I was living down, uh, that's two areas that my father lived on this particular, uh, what I call is a plantation. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's called the Mayday Place. Why was it called the Mayday Place? Uh, I never uh, really dug into it. Why did it call it the Mayday Place? But it was a play that further down on the river. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that's the name of the, of the place. So after my mother died in 48, uh, my father moved up further toward what you call Five Point and what you call the uh, Starter Place. Starter Place? Yes. Was this the name of a family? No, it, it may have been, but that was the name of the place that was owned by the same man. Okay. And uh, Who was his man's name? He was named John W. So. Sullen? Yes. Uh -huh. And so there, uh, we moved there about, uh, I believe, it was between uh, 50 or 51. Mm. Do you remember when you first started the school? Yes, because uh, down there, you didn't start the school, black didn't start school until you were seven years old. Mm. And so I was six years old when my mother died. So I started school the following year. Okay. So uh, what was school like? I mean, did you, I know in, in many cases, when you start the school, uh, in some of the rural areas, you started school at one point, maybe in August, and then you, you had to come out of school, right? Yes. Uh, I think uh, at that time, uh, uh, you started the school in May. If I'm not mistaken, was it May? No, pardon me, it was in uh, either, I think it was September. Okay. September. Right. Because May at the time that uh, we used to be coming out of school. Mm -hmm. And uh, from that, from May up to uh, around uh, August, uh, a little bit earlier, I would say about Mid June, my father was my father would lay by, and that mean the crop because we have to work in the field and we call we call it lay by. That mean the tr crop being taken care of and it being cultivated. And so we work from that time up the time to go to school. And so when time for to go to school is somewhere along in uh, and like it was in August or September, so along. Uh, uh, we would go in and rest and uh, sign up for school. And then after the, the cotton began to, uh, the buds began to come on the cotton and they uh, began to crack open, and then we had to get out of school and go to the field and pick the cotton. Well, you had to get the cotton up out of the field at a certain time before the one uh, come in. Uh, your school, how large was the school that you attended in elementary school? How they, many, how many uh, they had, uh, well, I don't know exactly how many students had, but... Uh, Did it go from first to yeah, the eighth grade? First to the sixth grade. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, it went to first to the sixth grade. Right. 
and then you went from that school to uh, junior high school? Yeah, which is B. Lodge. Uh, well, it wasn't, B. Lodge was later on, but they had another thing to called Key High School. Mm -hmm. And and then they, uh, when I started school, when I, when I finished the sixth grade, they had built what they called the Key High School. Keith. Yeah, Keith, Keith yeah. High School. Okay. And they had another elementary school next to it. And from now, you would go from sixth grade until about the eighth grade. But I never did a 10 that particular elementary school because I have a 10 to 1, 9 and 5 point, which is below it. I mean, excuse me, uh, uh, property. Right. In, in your high school days, were you active in any extracurricular activities? Did you play any, any ball or participate in any other activities around the school? Well, I played baseball. And, uh, you had a baseball team at school? Yeah, we have. Uh, let me go into detail about that. Uh, there was no uh, baseball uh, team as such until you went to uh, B. Lodge. Uh, not B. Lodge, but I keep saying B. Lodge, but it one in high school. Keith High School. Okay. And, uh, and that was a basketball team. But when I was coming up, uh, I didn't get a chance to play on the basketball team because I left there when I was about 17 and all this began to unfold about basketball. They had one at, at uh, they did have a, a basketball team at B. Lodge High School. And, and, and what positions did you play? I was a pitcher at, in baseball mm -hmm. and also a catcher in baseball. Yeah. Well, was baseball was your favorite sport? Yeah, because that's all we had. Mm -hmm. uh, we didn't, at the time, we didn't have basketball. A football. There was no football period mm -hmm. uh, at, at uh, Keith High School when I left I'm down there. Mm -hmm. So you left Keith High School and then did you come to Birmingham? And I came to Birmingham in 59. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I always wanted to be uh, a boxer, you know, want to fight. Mm -hmm. So I uh, I came, when I came to my house, so I joined the YMCA. And I can't call Mr., I can't call that fellow that instructor with them. So mm -hmm. uh, I boxed a lot and went to the YMCA on the south side. And uh, Mr. Mark, I think it was named Mark or Mara, whatever it was. But anyway, I was told and went to my ground for the Golden Glove. And but uh, I got tired with the Christian movement, so I never did get a chance to. Mm. So when you came here in Birmingham, did you go to work or did you go, go back to school? I went to work. I went to work at you know, a paid place called Birmingham Paper Company. Mm -hmm. And they later merged with St. Regia Paper Company. Right. And uh, which makes school supplies. How did you happen to come to Birmingham? Well, uh, I had got tired of working uh, uh, sharecropping. And I, uh, I told my dad, I said, I'm not going to sharecropping no more. Because that particular year, prior to my coming to Birmingham, uh, my dad made 50 bales of cotton. 50 bales of cotton? 50 bales of cotton. And and we have what you call at the end of the year, what you call a settlement. The, the white man would come and pay my dad off on all the cotton we would pick and harvest. At the end of the year, he would get him a certain amount. That's yeah, supposed to be half of what Right, it's supposed to be a half of what that he had made. And the white man did all the selling. You know, he, he had a truck we just sent him to pick it and they came to the gin house and they will, you know, go process it. And, 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 and each week my dad would get a check and this helped carry us through. Until the end of the year, it would be called uh, half and half. You see, a check each week for the work that he would do. 
So if you say that he was receiving that check every week, right? Rather than at the end of the term, right? Okay. So at the end of the year, what I call a settlement, hmm. and then all the people that only play would come in that once a year after we had harvest everything at the end of the year. So they would call me one by one and call my dad, because uh, my mother was no longer living that time. So I myself and, and uh, I think one, one more of my brother or sister went in with him to sit down with the white man for him to tell us what the hell we doing this year. And uh, so uh, he went through the little things and said, well, uh, uh, Mr. John Wayne, you had a nice crop of fine a group of people did good work and, and said, here's your part. And, uh, and he gave me checks. It was uh, $1,600. And uh, at that time, I, I went to left, I, I asked, I said, my dad, I told him, this all $1,600, I'm 50 bales of cotton. And how much is a bale of cotton? Uh, that I didn't know. Mm -hmm. But, uh, uh, I know at the time that uh, uh, when we went out and picked cotton, we would pay something like three dollars a hundred pounds. You had to pick a hundred pounds. So we had what you call uh, uh, after they, they processed the cotton, it got a seed, got seeds in it. And, uh, and they take the seeds out and you go through the gen hall and separate the seed from the cotton. And a bale of cotton weighed anywhere from 400 up. So all our bail didn't fall low than 400 because if it fell low than 400, those you call a light bail. And it's, it's, it's cheap. And so uh, uh, I mean, my eyes began to come over and I had a little school. And a uh, little bit I didn't know, I told my dad, I said, how did the bail come? Uh, I think this. This was not enough, you being cheated. And I said, only $1,600, 50 bales of cotton. And uh, we don't know what, how much it called for bail. We don't have no receipt how much he got for bail. And uh, I said, I'm just not going to wait in the morning field. So I left, started waiting for, uh, for my dad along with the white man, went and wait for him. Another man, which is a black man, he owned his own land. I drove a tractor. Mm -hmm. Had other brothers of yours that were older? Did you have brothers that were older than you? Yeah, I had two, I had three brothers older than me. Mm -hmm. By this time, they all had left. And where had they gone? The one, all three of them here in Birmingham. Mm -hmm. And I had one to leave Birmingham. The next oldest one went to Cincinnati, Ohio. And there he was killed in 1956. So you, you then had brothers here, right? When you when you came, so that was sort of attraction to get you to come to Birmingham, right? Had they come back and told you about Birmingham? Yes, I had came to Birmingham prior to my coming fifth to eight, and stayed with my old brother while I'm doing the summer, and uh, I liked it, and so. Although I had relative, other relatives in Birmingham and Bessemer, I had about four uncles living in Bethlehem, which was my mother's brothers. So, well, when you went to work for the other man, and you say you drove a tractor, how was that in terms of pay? Is that what's different? Oh, uh, it was, if I'm not mistaken, at that time, something like two dollars and fifty cents a day. Hmm. That was an improvement. Over picking the cotton. Right. Uh, but that was not attractive enough to keep you on the farm. No, it was not. So, how, you remember how long you, you worked for him? Uh, I think about six months, and I didn't like it. I thought the money was a little too much, wasn't enough money, so I left. And, and uh, me and another friend of mine were doing a song. I went to a cell and to a candy factory there. And I wanted to even get on. So I, I, I met up on another man that was a, a cop. He did, Tordown Howard was a black man. And I went with him. 
and now uh, he paid me pretty good. And so, uh, so how long did you stay in Selma? Uh, I just went there and worked. I wasn't living in Selma. Oh, I see. I just go there every morning. I would catch the bus and go to Selma and work with him. And after and after no one got off. Salem is about 15 miles from there to Albeville, mm -hmm. and from Albeville down to Five Pound, about five miles. So when I got all the way, I would walk from Salem uh, to Albeville, and most times that I did I would ride. So you would you would walk until someone would pick, pick you. Yeah. So that's about 20 miles, then. Yes, it is. Mm -hmm. And how long did you do that? I did it about six months. So I know if I got to Albeville, uh, there was a lady, that a white lady that lived down below us. She would get off around six o'clock, around five, six o'clock, and I'd go to her. She worked there in Albeville. She worked at this depot. Mm -hmm. And I'd ride home with her. So sure. most time I got a ride from when I was on the highway walking. Mm -hmm. So uh, people would be able to do it by picking me up. Well, now this white woman that you got to ride with, who is she? Her name was Miss Wilson. Uh, she was living down not too far from, from where she had a, a, a place. She was living with her, I think it was her aunt and her grandmother. She was old. She was a secretary at the depot up in Albany. And she, everybody knew everybody. And we got along just fine. She would pick me up, bring me. Of course, she had to pay it by my dad's house to get to her house. So she would drop me off. So was there a relationship between the families? She knew your father, right. And, right? And they had mutual respect for each other, right? We yeah. used to go in, uh, there was a uh, pecan orchard, and uh, we used to go in uh, and pick a pecan for her mm -hmm. and get them, and, uh, and she would pay us and give a part of the pecan. She was an older woman. Right. Okay. Um, how did you get the job, the first job that you got when you got to Birmingham? When I came to Birmingham, I had a sister and a brother living in Birmingham. Well, I had two brothers. My uh, third and oldest brother and my oldest sister were living together. Uh, my brother and my sister were working at the chicken house, what they call Marshall Duck Chicken House Produce. And I came up, I came up to visit, really, and I, I, I did want to stay, but they weren't too much about me staying. They wanted me to go back here with my dad. And I told them I wasn't going back because I, I, I didn't want to go back. So I went to apply for a job being another guy that I know named Robert. So he said, he told him what he was hiding. So we went to Birmingham Paper Company and we filled out an application there, him and I. And we got hired the same day. What, kind of, what kind of work did you do? I was a uh, 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 stock uh, uh, hammer. Uh, I was stocking uh, paper uh, inside the warehouse. Yeah. What was the post paper company located? It was located on 6 a.m. New South. And uh, that would be, no, excuse me, Fifth Avenue South. And uh, that'll be 20th Street. Mm -hmm. Right there where Old Bananas used to be there. Right. Okay. They tore it down, street. right, and built a uh, uh, government building there. Mm -hmm. Income tax place. That's right. Yeah. yeah. 21st Street. Right. 21st Street. 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 Yeah. yeah. Um, how long were you there? I went there about. Uh, uh, good, I would say maybe two years mm -hmm. because see, uh, uh, I got hired in '59 in April '59, and uh, I worked there 1960, and I worked there 1961. It's almost two and a half years, and and I got involved with the Crystal Movement while I was working there. Mm. What neighborhood? Did you, were you living in? At that time, I was living in North Birmingham uh, uh, on 10th Avenue. Mm -hmm. it used to be a Buffalo Rock uh, soda place there on 26th Street. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, 
That's where my sister lived in there. But by that time, my sister moved out of North Birmingham and my brother. So uh, I had put in an application while I was living there on 10th Avenue. And so we moved out there in North Birmingham, right off, right across from uh, uh, U.S. Pipe Shopping Center. Uh, it's closed down now to call it Gateway. And, uh, and so, uh, and that's where I, I was a store crawl from where I was living. It, it fell in the home was the Italian, his name was Tony. So when I filled up the application over there, I gave him the telephone number, what, the company, uh, St. Uh, Birmingham Paper Company called and reached me. So I received a call to, to come to go for a, a physical examination. So you gave the number at Tony's? Tony Stone. Uh, and and he called me, came to send me, he had a guy that waited for him that day, sent me over there, told him I had a telephone call. And uh, I had been praying at the Lord to bless me with a job. And so uh, uh, when that phone call came in, I went on the other one, that's who it was. Mm -hmm. uh, Birmingham paper company questionnaire, uh, with the questionnaire. So they asked me, what can, mean, can I come and, uh, and go to get a physical examination? Yeah, I went to a doctor, Thurf, I believe it was the name of it. It was right there on Third Avenue and then crawled from the YWCA, where the Blue Cross here right now. It's a bill sitting there on the cone. It's still there. We got some lawyers in. Right. Well, that's where the doctor was. Mm -hmm. Dropping near 24th, 25th Yeah, something along. Mm -hmm. um, how long? Did you work for um, the paper company? I worked there about two and a half years. Mm -hmm. So uh, I got tired of being there. Chris the Bowie man and, uh, and the new broke that I was involved and they knew about it. Uh, they picked the around, picked the around, picked the around until they fired me. Mm -hmm. Well, how did you get involved in the movement? Well, I got involved in it because uh, DeMars and Dr. Kane show work at first uh, I learned about show uh, show weeks before I came to Birmingham because a lot of Mars was going on during that time show at first in front of him to Philip High School with his children be by change. And so uh, it just made me interested because all we had a home in thirst for for being set free and all we thought something was wrong that why should we be treated the way we was treated because of the color of our skin. Mm. And that was just in me. And uh, so, uh, of course, we had a little running in before I left uh, all the way with the white man. Yes. About another friend of mine, uh, he was the type of white folk, they didn't do nothing you wanted to do, they tried to beat you up. So this particular friend, I, I was, uh, he went to beat him up and uh, and so he took the, the, the equipment that he had and went whooping with him. And, uh, and so he had to leave from now there. And we take him to a sale to catch the bus and he went to Gary and Anna. Was this a person that, that, that you were working for? Yes. On, on, his, on his plantation? That's right. And this is the man where that uh, you lived on his land. Right. And this, your friend, also lived on his land? Right. And who? who what was the uh, problem? What happened? The problem was that uh, uh, there was some type of conflict with the works because his, his, he was living with his grandmother at the time. That was some old boys. And like I said, uh, when it comes to a time that they have a running in, you always white man, he, had, he thought he had the privilege to beat you. Uh, but none of us, except my oldest brother, was. Uh, was jumped on by a white man. And, but he was living in Birmingham. He, he, he accused my brother of uh, coming down and taking some of the people away one by one, which was some of his in-laws. And, and there came a hard feeling between the white man, Mr. Sutherland, and my dad. And so the thing began to unravel. We had never had nothing like that to happen for all while it was coming up. And then and we thought that it was wrong for him to do this. So uh, we taken the young man named Chester. 
And so his dad lived in Gary now. So he left there. He lived to come back to Gary. So he moved from Gary back to New York. And that's why he died in New York several years ago. Mm -hmm. So the man attempted to whip him. Right. And, and. Oh, he, he, he didn't take it. Did he fight back? Uh, what happened? He took, he had a right for the hit. Took it. Took it from the white man. Right. Mm -hmm. And so he was so outdoor because he never had this to happen to him. And so he got mad and went home. And we would assume he went to get his gun. He came back and my dad on the automobile. So we rushed him to sell him. Put him on his pound. The grandmother who lived there told us to get him out down there. So we came to sell him. We put him on the bus and, and uh, he went to Gary. Mm -hmm. Well, what was the white man's response then to, to your father for getting him? Well, he never didn't know who taken him. Mm -hmm. So that then sort of, sort of set the tone for your relationship with uh, this man that you were living on his, on his plantation. Right. Yeah, that said, set my tone with white folk, period. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 you know, Prior to my, to my coming from coming to Birmingham, uh, after I, I, one thing I missed that uh, after I stopped uh, waiting with my father on the phone, I started to drive a track also with this white man who was paying three dollars a day, and uh, and I would plow one day some coma, and I had the, uh, the tractor and uh, and a gear that I shouldn't have had it in and run faster so I can get through plowing the corn quicker. And I curve up a lot of corn. Mm. So he came out and see how I was doing and looked at the corn and told me the corn was covered up. I run too fast. When I got out of there, so uh, I got out, I told him he got off track. I got out of he told me get out and uncover. Every, every bit of it, every road that you uncover, you got out and uncover. And I told him I wasn't going to uncover nothing. And uh, so I left the crack, tractor park there and run and went home and, and, uh, and sit and sit on my dad's put where I was living at. And so he got my, told my dad what I had did. And so that's one reason I didn't wait for him. That's that when, that when I went to the, the black man and started driving Mr. Harris. Mm -hmm. And that's how that happened. What did he say to your dad? Uh, he told my dad, he said, you get, you, your boy get smart. I don't want to do what he tell me to do. And so uh, I didn't have enough sense to realize that when you call the problem, it meant to my dad and I realized it. But I couldn't stop there. So uh, I had to take a stand. So uh, I left and came to Birmingham. What did your dad say to you? He didn't say anything. Mm -hmm. uh, I came even then when I got my job, I came back down and see him all. So I had a two young sister that was uh, down there and I uh, helped them to make the high school. Mm -hmm. I supported them. Okay. So then you then came on to Birmingham and you got involved with the movement. Right. Do you remember the first, uh, did you go to any of the, um, the mass meetings? Yes, sir. Do you remember the first one that you attended? The first one I attended to was the first one I attended to really was, uh, uh, at the time, was a uh, 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 New Pill Baptist Church. And this when uh, Dr. King came and had a, he made, he spoke there. It was so crowded, he couldn't get out there to get in. And so, uh, I mean, the Christian movement used to meet on Monday night. They used to meet right here at 16th Street Baptist, that was the headquarters. Mm -hmm. And that's where most of they met it was 16th Street Baptist Church, and that's how I started out. What, what do you remember about that first meeting? You said you didn't, you were not able to get in, it was so crowded. Um, how did that impress you? It impressed me a whole lot because Dr. Kane was a man, he, I never heard a man uh, uh, spoke, you know, so eloquent. You know, he, he was a dynamic speaker. It was just something I knew about being on speaker. 
It was just something that this man, it, it, it was in him that, and when he spoke, everybody listened. And, it, and it's, it, it, I appealed to him, his speech got sank deep into me. And uh, and so, I, you know, I used to go to church now in my hometown, and all the preachers would preach about it. It's uh, John 3.16, God's a little world. And uh, Nicodemus, you know, that's all right too, but uh, that wasn't, it was showing me how to serve God, but wasn't showing me how to pull myself up out of what we call the mother clay and to make a better life of myself. How, did somebody invite you to that first meeting? How did you find out about it? Uh, I don't think nobody invited me really because uh, it was in me when I came to Birmingham to, to uh, try to develop my condition. And so when I came to Birmingham, I learned about it. You know, listen to the radio. At that time, Shelly the Playboy and uh, Willie McKenzie was on one of the main disc jockey mm. at that time. Did they, did they announce meeting? Yeah. To talk about the right, movie? right. They did, and uh, so uh, I began to attend the, the Monday night meeting, and then I followed up, and I, I got hooked up with it, and I couldn't turn it loose. In mm -hmm. uh, Early 60s, you went out to Legion Field to a football game? Yes, uh, Alabama and Georgia Tech. Me and another friend of mine named Wilson Brown. I think now he lived in Atlanta. And uh, uh, there was some friend of him, which was white, actually went to the ball game. At the time, it was in a great sort of thing. So, yeah, so he got two tickets. And uh, we had met one another in the Christian movement. So he asked me what I was. I said, sure, why not? And so we went to this ball game on Saturday. And so we sat there until the game was over. And while we was in the game, there was some white crowd saying, we got two niggas in here. So we just sit still because we had been instructed to not to take the uh, fans of no on um, bow and not to fight back. This is from the movement. Right. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we sit there until the game goes out. The game goes and we can go out and they attack us. So I ran out the gate toward Greymouth and Wilson went another way and, uh, and I ran to the police. The police car was sitting there. I ran to the police. The police stopped me. And so the police, there's a lot of them got around the police. The police told me to get in the car. I got in the car. Set in the car. And then when well, I got in the car, the one of the road nine, one of them stuck his fist through there. The one that hit me in the face. And so the police got me and brought me on down town to the city jail. And they called and came in and questioned me. Did I could identify him? And I told him no, I didn't know who he was. And uh, they knew who he was because they were one stopped him. But they didn't make any arrests? Nothing, not whatsoever. Do you remember what year this was? That was in uh, 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 61. Was that early? Mm -hmm. okay. we, were there other blacks at that floor? No, the only two of them were I, myself, Jimmy, and Wilson Brown. And they let you in to Legion Field through the same gates that everybody else was going to? Right. Through? Because they had to, because at that time, this would have been emigrated, mm -hmm. going down. Mm -hmm. And a lot of things black would not exercise the law to pretty deal at it. Right. So only black was there with those that had on white coats. Mm -hmm. um, how would you describe um, mass media? What was it like? Mass media was very inspiring to me, inspiration, I call it. And it was something to motivate you. It was a type of meeting that would uh, educate you, tell you what rights you had, and what the law stood for. Uh, you have a right, and uh, and then when we receive a right, you should exercise your rights. And uh, and this helped motivate me more. 
then I began to act upon and the law was passed, then I began to, uh, you know, they say I had that privilege to do these things, so I tried it out. You um, made the attempt to desegregate the buses by riding the buses. Right. Uh, can you explain how that happened? Well, after they passed the law that you have a right to sit and we're on the bus, you don't have to sit in the back no more. I was coming from work at this particular time, I mean, that brought him paper company. That evening, I got off work at 3 o'clock. And uh, I got on the bus, and uh, this, uh, it was a seat vacant outside this white fellow. And all the racist black folk were sitting in the back, they were standing up, and then when nobody sits in the seat. So I sat beside him, and he grabbed me. He said, ain't no nigga gonna sit by him. He was an Alabama man. Nobody nigga gonna sit by him. So he grabbed me and I stayed in the city. So the bus driver pulled over and called the police. He physically grabbed you? Mm -hmm. And what did he do? Did he try to push you no, out of the seat? No, he tried to push me out of the seat and I held on to the seat. Mm -hmm. And we well, was instructed not to fight back. Right. So the bus driver stopped the bus, called the police. He stopped the bus, got off, and made a phone call. Yeah, right there on 26th Street and uh, about uh, 20, uh, what it was, 20th Place Avenue, uh, uh, 20th Avenue, North Birmingham. Hmm. Called, talked on the telephone, but then called the police. The police came there. There was two of them. And he came and said, they uh, sit back there. So the police came on the bus and asked me to come off the bus. So I came off the bus, mm -hmm. and they searched me, and, uh, and the actual white fellow, like this the one, he said, yes, and uh, he asked me, well, what did I do? I told him, uh, I sat down beside him, I had a right to. So, and he said, okay. He said, well, get in the police car. They arrested me and take me in and locked me up. And what were the reactions of uh, the people on the bus when you sat down and then refused to get up? Well, at first, uh, once some, I don't know all the things you said, but uh, I could see the phasing and some of them, how heavy it was. And, and it said, stand up and be a, a man. And, and, and they, nobody else was, had enough news to sit beside a white person on the bus. And they all fucked me. I remember there was a person on the bus that I knew. And, uh, and uh, she came to, uh, to trial to testify in my behalf. And uh, while I was in the, while I was in the uh, car, the police took me to the city hall downtown. Then he transferred me in one of those uh, trucks. And he told me, he said, well, you, these are one of the shows. You just want to show what uh, uh, demonstrating us, that's right. And uh, so uh, they carried me over on this south side. Was the bus crowded at that? Yes, real crowded. It was so crowded, but the people standing up on the bus. So there were, there were seats vacant in the front of the bus? Right. Yeah, you always have been making seats to come to white folks because more black really rode the bus. And uh, at this particular stop, this white lady got off the bus, sat beside the white gentleman. And I said, I'm sorry. Well, what was the outcome of, of your arrest? How long were you in, were you in jail? I got out of jail the same night. I got arrested late in the afternoon. How did you get out? Of, uh, uh, Warren Bell Company, remember Warren? Mm -hmm. He bailed me out. Oh, okay. Um, and then you eventually went to trial. I went to trial. The judge found me guilty and gave me 108 days. How much of that did you serve? No. Why not? There was Warren again. Bail me, repeal him, I appeal my, my case. Appeals went up to 
yeah, appealed my case, and uh, and so I got out on bail. And uh, that Monday night, I went to the meeting, Christian movement meeting, out here in East Birmingham. They had that night they used to change church, you know. Hmm. And uh, I don't know exactly. I think it was. I don't know what the name of the church I read now, but it was one of the big Baptist church out there in East Birmingham. Hmm. So when he was he went out there with me, I told what had happened. So uh, W. L. William was the lawyer at that time that when I got arrested and my trial came up, he represented me. Hmm. So then did you ever win that case? Uh, we appealed it to a uh, uh, state court. And they found me not guilty and got the 108 days off. I had to pay a fine for about 108 dollars for court costs. Mm. You also went out to Dobbs House Restaurant, right? Out at the airport. Tell me about that experience. We went out there one Sunday afternoon. Uh, I myself and uh, and uh, Jim Henry and. Uh, 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 Willie Hicks and Jack Daniel. Uh, they had never been a city out there. So we decided we would go out there and get us a meal. Just as we walked in, uh, we, we seated. And they refused to serve us. So they refused to serve you. They refused to serve at first. And then the white people come in and out of the planes coming in. They was coming in and out. They come in and get some meat. So then we told them, I said, well, we said, well, now you he told them they was closed. I said, closed? How are you closing? And the white people come in here and you wait on them. And so uh, they finally decided they would wait on us. And we all got a ham sandwich and a Coke. And they charged us ten dollars a piece for a ham sandwich. It's expensive ham sandwich. Right. Yeah, very expensive at that time. And so we sit there and eat and pay for it. Jim said he wasn't gonna eat his and he's gonna take it home and keep it, put it in the freezer. He did. And we had ours. And then and from there on. They closed the cafeteria, and they would let nobody else come in. And then they told us they were closed. We would have to leave, so we left. But so you were not arrested. We was not arrested because by that time they had passed the law saying they had a right to go in. And be See. Um, were you ever arrested again? For demonstrating? No, I never arrested. I only arrested one time. That was the quack that was on the bus. Mm -hmm. So uh, after that, after they, after I got fired and I had, I was freeling in to get around. So Wilson Bryan and I went to Atlanta to a snake organization. Well, before you we went to snake, though, how, how were you? Why were you fired? I know that you were active, but how did they do it? How did it actually happen? I was fired uh, simply because they they accused me of uh, uh, lying around on the job. I had never had no problem on my job. And they framed up for me. They had got the news that when I got to work that morning, all the guys told me some bands, and we heard all on the radio that how you went out to a digital field, what had what not, you know, most of the white folks. They watched mm. the TV, listened to the radio, because that was the Alabama plane. Mm. And and uh, when I got to work, I could see how they looked at me, the white people there. My supervisor, my walked in, they gave me a cold shoulder. So it wasn't long that I was telling them, we had a union there, but they wouldn't want to do that no, mm -hmm. much because they were somewhat, uh, you know, stiff and tired. The ticket, you said that you got the tickets though from another white guy? Right. 
that work with you? No, he didn't work with me. He got it from Wilson Brown, the one got the ticket. Mm, from the white guy. Okay. Because uh, the impression I got, what he told me, uh, this guy really wanted some blacks to go to the game. And he offered him these tickets, would you go? And he said, yes, give me the tickets. And they gave him, he said, I mean, with two tickets. So he called me and we got to go. Mm. Yeah. So you then also worked for SNCC in Atlanta, you said? Yes. Uh, why, did you, why did you decide to go to Atlanta? Well, uh, we, at that time, they didn't have too much of a sneak with a well-known uh, power organization, such as training folk how to demonstrate and, uh, you know, protect yourself at all times and, and, and not strike back. And uh, so uh, we went there to some classes, to Mohouse College. Wilson and I take some classes there, we sit here. And also we went to uh, 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 Talladega College. They had some uh, classes there. We went there too. And, then, and believe it or not, this is the first time that uh, I ever have been on a college campus. Is that right? Yeah. Mm. Uh, uh, I, to tell you the truth, I, there was a college in Salem called Salem University College. And I didn't even know it was there until I came to work. Mm. And we wouldn't really talk to about things like this. I mean, when I went to the first car, I went to a talented car. Mm -hmm. And when I got there, I, I was so, I just lit up because I've never seen so many black folks at an institution. Mm -hmm. and, and beautiful people, you know, black people. And I just fell in love with it. And I would never even go to college no more than uh, uh, trade school. Bob College, Camp Bob College, mm -hmm. and uh, and so um, that's where it happened. So we we so you left Talladega, yeah, and went to Atlanta, went to Atlanta to Mohouse. Yeah, because that time I had got fired, and so while we went to Mohouse, and and uh, after I went to Mohouse and me and Wilson, so uh, we met this white girl from Chicago. She was part of the organization. And she wanted to come back to Birmingham with us. And there was another young lady with us. I can't think of that. What year was this? This was in '61. Mm -hmm. And uh, and there was another uh, black girl. Uh, she went out to Miles College. And that's how we met. I met her. And uh, so uh, we decided we'd bring the white girl back. And. You know, maybe we thought we'd get in the truck with But uh, the police trail was all the way from the time we left the mountain. When we got in Mary Ellen, Georgia, and we stopped at the bus station there to get something to eat. And this is why they saw us out here. And they trailed us all the way from all the way back home. We couldn't even get home. They would stop up and gave us tickets. So we Pulled around, turned around, called back to that call, Snick and told them what happened. So they got, we got an escort out of Mayor of the way out, We looked at it, we would intend to get out of Mayor of Georgia. So we, we called Snick and they sent somebody down and gave and uh, trailed us out of Mayor of Georgia. So did the girl come back to Birmingham? She came all the way back to Birmingham. And we, we came down and she stayed here because. I don't know who she stayed with, but I think the Chris movement put her up because uh, at the Monday night when we went to came to that meeting, we got someone chewed out uh, by bringing uh, this white girl all the way back from the Lama Rock. Was she in that meeting? Yes, she was. And but you don't know who she stayed with? No, uh, uh, if I'm not mistaken, I think the Chris movement put her up because we went down to Gaston Lounge. And then we met some uh, 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 some of the movement people. Uh, uh, I can't think of this guy's name, but he was the guy that went to jail with uh, show works. The preacher, I uh, can't think of his name right now, but we talked to him. At that time, show works wasn't there. So he passed it on to show and everything. They got together, they got together, put it up at the motel. 
how did you use your training that you received at Claudia and Morehouse? I used, well, I, I, I used to my advantage because uh, after that, I got married in 62. I married to my wife that I got now. And, uh, and so uh, at that particular time, I was drawn unemployed. I would get something like, uh, I think it was $27 a week. And if not mad, I think it was $27 or $22. And I married my wife while I was drawing on it. And then I said to myself, I had got married, I said, no, I told her, you know what, uh, I'm getting out of this. Um, uh, it's just not for me. I lost one job. And so, so my brother went at U.S. Pike, my oldest brother. So he got me on out there at U.S. Pike. I got hired out there in 62, uh, December 17th, I believe, 16 or 17. Right, so then did you leave the movement at that time? No, I didn't really. It was in the hall where I left for a while. Mm -hmm. And I got out there and uh, I stayed out there about, uh, uh, I said around 60, last of 63. Then I found myself, I nearly quit going to the movement meeting. Mm -hmm. Then I found myself attacking the people out there. U.S. Bank because of the discrimination they had out there. Mm. And then I met, they just waited the Lord and fixed it. I met a fellow called Willie Hicks out there. And Jack Daniel. And, uh, and, uh, and, and, uh, 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 uh Henry mm. Brothers. Okay. Uh, so these were the guys that you went to the Dobbs house with? Right. Uh, this was before or after you had gone to work? No, uh, when I went to Dog, I was waiting at US Bank. I got high. Mm. But see, I know Jim Henry before I started waiting at US Bank. Okay. But I didn't know Willie Hicks and Jack Danny. Mm. Because, see, the movement, we all was in, we all were in Kirby, go down to the Henry Brother in Palestine, you know, uh, about get your food and eat down there. Mm -hmm. and that's how I learned about the Henry Brothers, because they were part of the Christian movement. And so when I got hired at the U.S. Pike, one brother was waking out of the night, Jim. Mm -hmm. And so, and, uh, and, and all this stuff began to blow. So they finally found somebody who has enough good to challenge the people out there at the U.S. Pike. Mm -hmm. And so uh, uh, I already was involved, you know, in filing grievance on the job. And so they, they came up to me somehow. And actually, me and I already had a little experience prior to coming out there. And so we got together with Hicks and Jim Henry and uh, Mac Daniel and myself. So the movement then sort of led you into the labor movement. That's right. Whereas in some older men's uh, careers, like the Colonel, Colonel Stone, he was in the labor movement and then he came to the movement. Right. So you're just the reverse. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and how has your experiences in the movement then uh, impacted upon you as you move through your various jobs? Well, uh, after I got when I got hired at U.S. Power, I started out this common label. Uh, so I began to be able to call be a bully, be it on jobs. But we have what we call a separate vote from the black and white. You only can be on what we call the colored jobs. And they had one side for the white job, you couldn't cross over. And so later on, I, we got together and I said, well, now I think we're entitled to be on the job we want to be on. And the laws are changing. You know, so we decided we'd be on them. Some of them got some of them didn't. And then those that we did get, didn't know white folk bid on, so they had to give it to us. So they find out ways to disqualify some of us. I never disqualified no one. And all they said you weren't doing the job. And but simply have a union out there, they couldn't file because if you bid to a job, you have 30 days to do the job. If you could they, you didn't come to their stomach, they would disqualify you and put you on another job or either lay you off until the job come up and you can come out there and bid on one. And so the Christian movement kind of gave me an insight to how to help myself on the job. 
And I had this little train that I had went to Talladega and also to Atlanta, the SNCC organization. And that's what they taught about how to be moving up and things. Come over, you got to be able to accept the opportunity to pay it. And so uh, that's how I started out. And so I almost got to run off. They tried to run me out my level, but they weren't able to do so. I had to get on the um, file complaints. Again, even file complaints against the union. Because when I got involved in it, uh, I went to the union hall and I discovered that uh, the union was sucking in. The union itself was sucking in? Right. What union is this? There was the Molders Union. Hmm. It's known now, it's called, it used to be the, the Molders Allied Workers Union, but they merged and they come to the GMP. Hmm. Glass, molding, and plastics. Right. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the president of the union, he was nothing but a Ku Klux. He rolled around with Ku Klux signs. So um, after I got there, I went to the union meeting. I looked and looked and seen the water fountain. The other had white on, color on. They had separate rest room in the, in, the, in the union hall. And I looked at all that. I said, Nah, uh, I'm trying to straighten out uh, U.S. pipe. And then here I'm paying my union dues. And I ain't free of the union hall. And so, uh, so uh, what I did was. We got that guy, Hicks and I, and uh, Jack Daniel and uh, Jim Henry. I said, we decided we were sitting in at the Union Hall where all the white was sitting in, and all the black ones on one side, all the white ones on one side. So still sitting over the so called black side. We were sitting on the obvious side where the white sit. So uh, they just said no. What did the, the black workers say? Uh, they just sit on the other side and they said nothing, nothing either. But it's motivated them. They say, you always got to have a leader. And so after we broke that down, they began to emigrate. So there was a lot of talk. And so, uh, and, uh, so fine, they finally accepted it. So we told them, I said, now you all going to have to move uh, uh, the signs you got up here. And, uh, and so they did. This is a union without a charge. And so uh, it still got a two same water fountain. There's two water fountains still there. They're there, still there. It's still there, there today, but they uh, they don't have the signs. Right, and the restroom, they yeah, have color and white restroom. They still got the same two restrooms. Right. Are they still used? Is black used one yeah, restroom? No, we all use all. We all use all the restroom. Okay. So, and and we, the fountains you use the yeah. And found, but they are still there. They are still. And there. you remember when they did have the signs? Right. So you have made uh, quite a contribution into changing your workplace and really changing your city in right. relationship to um, to desegregating various places. Right, because after that, uh, you know, uh, I uh, after my eyes came open, then I began to attend the meeting, found what it's all about. And then I ran for office, but I, I, I didn't make it. And so a lot of black were on. They always did have two blacks on the committee, mm -hmm. handpick. And uh, uh, so they didn't have a two. You couldn't let a two. You had seven committees on two beyond that. Two what, what do you mean by handpick? Well, the handpicked by the white people. You, you mean you, you couldn't vote the. You voted, but you voted. We voted, but uh, well, then we had to call a nomination. And so uh, uh, they always would nominate uh, uh, what I call uh, rubber stamp blacks. Mm -hmm. And we didn't nominate them, so uh, they always worn out. Some we call all the white folks on both of them, too. There are more whites in your company. It was more than white in the, uh, the union. And the union, but it wasn't more uh, white in the play on regular. We, at that time, when I went, they had 700 employees, mm -hmm. and uh, 400 of them was black. Hmm. What's the, what are the figures today? Uh, well, we had a lot of cutback uh, as years go by, but you still still predominantly black. Still predominantly black. But blacks don't join the union. Yeah, they belong to the union. Uh, black have a way. Uh, some of them still uh, stigmatized. You know, uh, they think things just ain't gonna get no better. And all there, I found out to find. You want to find out what goes on in the house? You got to get on the inside. And on the outside, looking in, you can't be much of a citizen. And so, 
and I proved to them that what they can do if you could come together. So we started having me outside, you know, mm. Jeff Blacks mm -hmm. at the YW, YMCA on the south side. Mm. And I was the head of me and Hicks, and we had a secretary of treasury, president, thing like that. And so we would get blacks to come and educate them about what they can do. Some of me thought I was wrong. They gave me bad eyes, said, I'm going to lose my job, you call all us to lose our job. And I said, well, I said anything that's not worth fighting for, it's not worth having. And so I had made up my mind, and I had told the Lord, Lord, you know, I said that uh, I won't get involved in but here I am, I guess I'm going to get wrong. I mean, you didn't pay me no attention in the first place. Mm -hmm. and so. Do you see yourself running for office? Yeah, I know down the road there's just was a matter of time that I would be had my foot in the door. And so I got my foot in the door. Of course, I had to file a lot of complaints before I got in the door. Because there was no EEOC office here, branch here in Birmingham at the time. And we are responsible for the EEOC branch here. Uh, I myself, the guy with the U.S. pipe that was on this committee before, and also Civic Code Pipe Shop. And U.S. Steel, we all in uh, 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 Stock and Bay, we had people from each plant, we all got together and had a meeting at the YMCA on Sunday afternoon, how we were coming by by strengthening ourselves while we were working. And this is how we, then we filed so many complaints, then they had to put a branch in. And that's how it came about. The first one that we put here was at on Eighth Avenue. 2120 bill. Mm -hmm. okay. So you've had quite a prominent career then. Right. And and agitated. Right. That was exactly they called me uh, agitator and called me a uh, uh, black Muslim. Mm. And uh, I told myself, well, I'm not a Muslim, but I am black. And I have nothing against black Muslim as such. I said, but I don't belong to the organization. But I am black, and I had 10 something the Muslim meeting at the time. But everybody, if you see, you was a uh, uh, stamp. When you get involved in certain thing, they mark you. And so they try to do everything, put the Ku Klux sign on our job, trying to discourage me. But they couldn't discourage me. But Mr. Warren, we cover a lot of territory today. Uh, is there anything else that we need to add? Yeah, um, after that, as I began to get hold and they see it, so we filed a complaint against U.S. Pipe to integrate all the sources, job, restroom, a bathhouse, and, and uh, everything out there. So uh, we have a big cafeteria right there, a building 1948. And, uh, and so they had blacks on one side, white on the other side, black going one door, white going another door. And uh, they had uh, the, the, the civil well and the, and the place thing, get out. Black, white had white place. We had green place. White had uh, white <laughs> coffee cup. And we had green coffee cup. And so they wouldn't even let us eat out the same uh, dishes. They had, they had segregated in there, they had a petition. So uh, we barcoded and said, well, the law will pass, and we're going to have to tear it down. So we stayed out of the cafeteria, and they couldn't operate. Stayed out of the cafeteria? We stayed out of the cafeteria, and then the president uh, of the, of the uh, pipe shop came by and talked to me and Hicks. Never forget it, Mr. Jack McGill. He even came, after that, came to the Hawaii. MCA Fold Avenue in the building and cut the ribbon. Mm. This is a black rock. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's when he moved from the south side the building one down here Fold Avenue, of course, now closed up. Mm. And, uh, and he asked me what was the matter. I told him, well, I said, the law paid, we have a right to the facility, and we are not going to go in and spend our money anymore, and all these signs got to come down. And so we bought cotton, so we closed the cafeteria up. Well, they couldn't operate because more black, it's all black, and the black folk love to eat, you know. And, uh, and so the, the people there, 
you just pipe on with the head. A contract people come in, cafeteria that run. So they said they couldn't operate. So uh, until you had to close down. So they filed, they'll take down the petition and everything. So we start going back in. Mm -hmm. We start going back in, then the white stop going in. And stayed like that for years. Mm -hmm. So we integrated the bath, all the white quit taking the bath, went home there. We integrated everything. So as they as the facilities are integrated, whites stop utilizing. That's them, right. And they become all black basically. That's right. And but eventually they would come back. Right. So they drift back. Some of them, some of them still go home. Mm -hmm. Then I became uh, in the behold the idea, and I was a hero. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I, I I didn't go around pat myself on the back, but I realized that what I had accomplished. And when some said I couldn't do it, and even some of the Union Fish and Black uh, got mad at us and uh, told us we were destroying things. And you, 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 what you're doing, you, you're taking our job. And uh, that's how we take your job. You ain't got no job. You mean, you're not even getting to your job. You hear a day gone tomorrow. That way we looked at it and we were. And so, uh, and things began to open up, we began to bid on the job, and then, and then Black. Him coming in here, started being on his job, he started getting a job, but they still were being high rest. And uh, so uh, we told them, well, we ain't got no black school loud. On and on, we see one thing lead to another. And, uh, and so we filed a charge on them, told them that uh, there's no black school loud, and there's no black in, in salary, there's no black in the office. So we had the first black person in person there was. Black woman named Jeanette Park. And uh, that's how they came about. And we had the first black uh, man, uh, they promoted him. Uh, his name was Glenn Jeff. Uh, you may remember sometime he got killed. Uh, he finally born up out here in the power or something. Uh, he was a deacon at the church out here in Brighton, I believe, somewhere. Not too long ago, seven years ago. But anyway, he became the first black supervisor. He was working in the store room, but he never put the people promoted, so he got promoted to supervisor. And then we began to, you know, step up. To move others into those positions. Well, I guess it, it appears that French Doug was right then when he said that uh, where there's no struggle, there's no progress. That's right. And obviously, where there's struggle, there's bound to be progress. That's right. You know, I often tell the people that uh, I said, and, and then they began to say, well, things just ain't gonna change. Well, uh, that's where the children is real fail. Until God sent Moses into Egypt and said, let my people go. And now all you got to do is take uh, everything you got and put it on your shoulder and walk out. I said, there's no longer uh, the old saying, uh, uh, you black get back. I said, now you got an opportunity to all the chain. Uh, we got to exile, all right. I said, some of them might not make it, some of them might get killed. I said, but we are willing to take the change. And we survived out here today. To say I'm still here at 54 years of age. When I went there, I was 20 years old. So I seen a whole lot of holidays and pain. But uh, it was that you know, I got able to move up. I had the opportunity to get some vibe. I didn't want it because I thought they would try to use me for a rubber stamp, trying to shift my mouth. And, uh, and I've been fighting, still fighting. I was the type of person, I, I couldn't see myself uh, being a supervisor at the time because I couldn't accept some of the things that, uh, that they would have a supervisor with them And then again, I know being a supervisor, a lot of things you can change, but I didn't want that position. I'm kind of like uh, Moses, I'd rather be with my peoples and to live in the Canaan house. Very well stated. Yeah. Mr. Warren, I want to thank you for taking time out of your schedule. Uh, you, you had mentioned earlier that you had some documents, and as I said, we would very much like to to be able to uh, to get copies of those at some point. You are more than glad, and I'm glad to to let you have your welcome to receive at any time. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you.